Good morning, everybody. My name is Steve Brocious, and Tina and I, and my wife is here, and we used to go to church here until we moved to Danville. It's awesome to be back. Uh, many of you folks I know, you're like family to us, and it's great to be here. I just thought of something, Alan. It would be a lot easier if we would just tape the first service and press play, and <laughs> I wouldn't have to do this twice. Yes, yes, it, would. it would be easier, but you know, sometimes things aren't easy. I'm here. I'm going to try to do what God has me to do today. And when I talk to you folks, most times I'm talking to myself too, believe me. So the title of what I wanted to talk about today is What Are the Odds? And in the first service, we worshiped that last song there, and it said, The God of Miracles. And it made me think, miracles don't happen without odds that are against you. Like if the odds were for you, it was in a positive, it wouldn't sound like a miracle, right? So we look at miracles, some we like call them small miracles, big miracles, whatever have you, and that may just be because we look at the odds of this certain thing happening, whatever that would be. And I didn't have that written down, it wasn't in my notes, but it kind of just really hit me, and it's cool how sometimes God just shows you things in a word that he, he kind of just uh, teaches you, you know? And that song really jumped out at me, like the miracles are when we're against the odds, and that's when God can move. And he's the God of miracles. He's the God that produces against the odds is kind of what he put in my heart this morning. He produces against what the odds are. Uh, I look around and I know many of you and I have a friend that's here and I know he would probably tell you just like me, if you would wind back many, many years, the odds of him and I being here were, would be very high. And that's just a testimony to God and what he does in our lives if we allow him. So I want to look on, I want to move on to a scripture, and I want to look at a, a man in the Bible who's only mentioned in two verses, and his name's Shamgar, and it's in the book of Judges. Judges 3, 31 says, After Ehud, Shamgar, son of Anath, rescued Israel, and he once killed 6,000 Philistines with an ox goad. His odds were 600 to 1 that were stacked up against him. And it's interesting when we... There's really not much said about him, but when we look into the little bit we see about him, we can see that uh, when we look in the book of Judges and get a timeline, he lived over 3,000 years ago. We probably can take a good assumption that he was a farmer because he had a tool in his hand, which is described as an ox goad. And an ox goad, when you look it up, is basically like a six to eight foot long wooden pool with a piece of steel and some things I read said a piece of bone tied to it. And it was used to prod the oxen in plowing. When they didn't want to plow so much, he'd give them a poke. And uh, I said in the first service, we ought to have them as parents for our kids. It'd be a kid goat, I guess you'd call it, or a kid goat. Kind of poke them along. But anyhow, my daughter's staring me down right now. But it's all right. You did a pretty good job. Anyhow, I want to look into this one scripture, and I think we're going to find a lot of things in this one scripture that can help motivate us in our walk with the Lord. There's three things in here that I want to kind of try to bring out. And the first thing is simply he started where he was at. Shamgar started where he was at, and that can speak to us today. We need to start where we are. Very simple. I think we would all agree that a big temptation or reaction when we're pressed and God calls us or this or that, or we hear a word from God, lots of times we just say, oh, I'm just not in the right spot right now to go that direction. You know, if I had this or I had that, or if I had the gift that this person had, you know, we kind of use those excuses to kind of just sit there and not make a move in any direction at all. But Shamgar, he simply started where he was. Uh, it doesn't look like he had any prestigious military training I don't think he was in a powerful position. Um, I don't think he was a CEO of a company. He was just a normal blue collar guy. He was a farmer and he started where he's at. He didn't sit around and wait for some miraculous miracle. He had to defend his property and his family. And he did that in his own field. He turned his farm field into a battlefield. And I think if we just get one thing today, if we would just have an image of what our life could be like, like Shamgar in the middle of our trial or situation, if we would just say to God, I'm willing to start right here where I'm at. Even though the circumstances you might be into or up against or the odds that are stacked against you, I don't know what they are. I have those in my life also, but we can all say that we're there, but we need to get to the point where we were just 
say yes and, and commit. Lots of times, the enemy will then, when you start to think you're going to commit, they'll put doubts in your mind and this and that, and we got to learn to discern that that's not of God. And as I went through all this material trying to get things down, what I would say and what I wouldn't say, I came across some different comments. And one comment I came across from was from Henry Ford. And he said, do you know most people get ahead during times others waste? I think it's a good thing. It's a pretty simple comment. If we're wasting time, we're going backwards. We're going backwards. You know, and lots of times we look at older folks and we, we kind of have, I'm one of them, I'm classifying older 50 and old, so I'm in your boat. But lots of times we get to this point in our life or this age where we kind of like want to put it neutral and just cruise control and kind of... Uh, some of the comments might be, it's time to coast. I'm on the other side of the mountain. I'm going to ride this out. I've kind of did my thing, and it's my turn to relax. I beg to differ. God doesn't put an age on his call in your life. Not at all. Not at all. Here's a couple things, worldly type things, that older folks that I came across when I was looking all this stuff up. Michelangelo was this famous painter, and at 66 years old, he painted the Sistine Chapel. And I, I, I have no art skills in me, but I remember hearing that. The crazy thing is when I read on more, at 88 years old, he painted the Pauline Chapel, which they say was his best work of art ever at 88 years old. George Bush Sr. at 80 years old went skydiving. And after he was done, he was asked, why did you do that? He said, I was yelling at Father Time, take that, you old man. Yukara Mira, who I don't know who this person is, but at 80 years old, it is said that this person climbed Mount Everest to the top at 80 years old. Harold Sanders, at 65 years old, got his first Social Security check, and for years and years, he was trying to promote one of his famous recipes for chicken, and it just failed and failed and failed, until at 65, he built his first Kentucky Fried Chicken, and that is the Colonel Sanders I'm talking about. So the point is, you're not too old. You're never too old to get a dream. You're never too old to get a vision. And dreams and visions come from God. That's what the Bible says. Years back when we used to go to church here, I helped with junior and senior high youth. And uh, talking with those kids was always a, a blast. Bill, I think you're one of the leaders now. You learn so much from youth. And, uh, you know, they have excuses just like us old people. And they would say, you know, I'm not smart enough. I'm, I'm, I'm only 16. You know, I, I'm heading to college. I don't think I can do that. You know, I'm, I'm not good enough. Age should never be a factor. I want to tell you, each and every one of you here, age should not be a factor. So we talked about young and old, so what about the middle age? You guys should be tearing it up then. If you have excuses when you're young and excuses when you're old, the middle age folks should have none, right? That's not true. I want to talk about Ben Franklin at 23. He operated and owned his own newspaper, the PA Gazette. At 25, he opened the first public library. At 30, he started the first nationally funded fire company. It said 11 of the 12 disciples of Jesus were teenagers when they first started with Jesus. John was 20. Jeremiah, a prophet, was 16. Josiah, a king, was 8. Timothy in the New Testament was Paul, Apostle Paul's protege. And Paul was edifying and building him up and getting ready to hand over the largest church in the world at that time to him. And of course, Timothy was saying, I can't do it. I'm too young. I don't have what it takes. I did this in the first service, and I'm going to embarrass you all, uh, younger folks. If you're under 30 years old, please stand up. Don't be shy. If you're under 30, I'm not going to come out and... I want to read something to you. We have a scripture here from Timothy. 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your life, in your love, and in faith and in purity. You young folks today are the future. Don't let anyone say anything that you can't do this or that because all things are possible through God. Thank you for standing up. The next thing I want to look at is number two. So number one, we learned we need to start where we're at. Number two, we need to use what we have. We need to use what we have. Shamgar used what he had. He had limited resources, obviously. All he had was an ox goad, and he stood his ground, and he defeated 600 to 1 odds. God has given each one of you an ability. He's given each one of you a talent. His word tells us that, and I trust his word. 
So we all have that. We all have a gift from God and we all have a talent. Look at Moses. Moses had a staff in his hand and when he stood before Pharaoh, God nudged him to throw it to the ground. And when it hit the ground, the supernatural came into that stick and it swallowed up Pharaoh's snakes. Later, Moses, we know, was leading the people out of bondage and they got to the Red Sea and he lifted his staff up and we all know what happened. The Red Sea parted. Each one of your miracle is not in what you don't have, it's in what you do have and God's already given you that. We also need to stop focusing on what we don't have. I'm guilty of this. Lots of times it's just like, I don't know, God, if I can do this, if I can go there, do this, or even come up on this stage and try to share with you folks. But we need to stop focusing on what we don't have. We need to start where we're at and we need to use what we have. I know there's something that each and every one of us has as Christians. If, we, if you call yourself a Christian today, I believe we all have passion and enthusiasm inside of us through the Holy Spirit. That's a promise from God. And when you look at the word enthusiasm, it comes in the Greek, it comes from two words. En is uh, within and theos represents God. So enthusiasm in a text stands for God within. So us as Christians, if that's what we say we are, we have no excuse if we don't have enthusiasm and passion. That, that should be part of, our, part of our everyday walk. There's days when that's down and I know that folks are going through things. I've talked to some folks earlier this morning when I got here, some friends, and, and, and it just feels like obviously the odds are against you. But we need to reach deep down inside and find that passion, that joy Alan talked about, that enthusiasm, and we need to, we need to uh, grasp a hold of that even when it doesn't feel like we should. I want to look at two scriptures here, and then we'll just kind of chew into them real quick. And the first one is in Luke chapter 8, 43 to 48. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me for I felt healing power go out of me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explanation why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. One more similar type scripture I want to read to you is in Mark chapter 10. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted the louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. And this jumped out at me, I said in the first service. So this gentleman was yelling out for Jesus. The religious people around him told him to shut up. And then when Jesus said something, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, come on up. It's kind of funny how the boss said something and then it was okay. But they called the blind man up and they said, cheer up and come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked my rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. And what we can take out of this, or what I got out of this as I read this several times, is that it's a good question. It kind of like questioned me, like, I know God's the worker of the miracle. It's his power. It's, 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 it's him. It's Jesus. But what's interesting here, if you look into those scriptures, is these folks had passion in them, and they were not settling they screamed, the, the blind beggar guy screamed, they told him to shut up, he got louder. And I hope that speaks to someone here today that you may be in a situation, you just need to get a little louder. Don't care what other people look around you or that are around you, what they think. You literally, I'm not a Bible scholar, but it looks like to me that these folks triggered the miracle that God performed from their passion. In Mark chapter two, there's a story where four guys bring their paralyzed friend into a home and how they got in the home was they tore the roof off because they couldn't get in the, in the door because there were so many people and they're listening to Jesus. And he was on a mat and it says they lowered him down through the roof. And we, we know what happened there. The man was healed. It leads me to the third thing that I see in Shamgar. Number one, 
we need to start where we're at. Two, use what you have. And three, like Shamgar, we need to do what we can. There's a pretty cool story of a Pittsburgh Steeler football player from back in the 60s and 70s. This is a firsthand account from his teammate. His teammate's name was Andy Russell. They were in the one championship game, and he was a lineman on the steel curtain. And on the one play, he broke his thumb, and the story is said that he literally, his thumb was torn off almost, the bone was sticking out, and it said that he tucked it into his hand and squeezed a fist around his thumb. And he came back in the huddle, and he said, what's the next play? The rest of the story, he finished the series, came to the sideline. He didn't run to the coach. He didn't run to the trainer. He didn't text his mom. He wasn't crying about it. He got some tape, and the first-hand account is he taped his hand up into a big ball. He didn't miss a play the rest of the game. They went on to win the championship, and in the locker room, it is said that the one, sent, the one phrase he said after the game, this big, burly guy, he's like, I think I need a doctor. Pretty cool story. Big, bruising guy like that. He played through it. But we can take a lot out of that story from Ernie. We need to learn as Christians, I think, to play hurt. So many times as Christians, and it's real, there's things that, you know, may have happened in your life, in your past, you're going through a tragedy right now. You may have lost a loved one. But we can't give up. We need to fight. We need to draw closer to God. And we need to learn to play hurt. And I got to be honest, I'm one of them. I call myself a Christian, but I think Christians sometimes were the worst when in fact we should be the most enthusiastic. Amen. We should be the most hopeful. We should be the most joyful people, yes. right? Yes. And, and like I said, I'm pointing the finger at me too. Like we need to step into what God has for us and grab a hold of those resources. They're not limited with God. Right. Shamgar was limited in the physical but you know what? Shamgar had passion. You don't take on 600 dudes and whip them if you aren't enthusiastic. <laughs> Amen? We need to learn to not get offended too. So often as Christians, you know, well, I want to say I'm going to brag about this church. Me and my wife grew up in this church when I, we became Christians, and we were equipped here. We came to Wednesday night classes. We weren't perfect. We're still not perfect, but... I will always say that this is our home and we learned so much here. And I remember one class we learned and it was about not getting offended. You know why? And at the time I took it, my wife was like, we're taking this. I'm like, eh. It was great because here's the deal. We can't like look at humans because they're going to let us down, right? If we hinge everything on what other believers who are believers, but they're just like us, they're fragile, we can't hang our faith on other people. We have to hang our hope on Christ because people will fail us. We can't hang our hope on the pastor. We can't leave today and say, oh, you know what? Alan didn't hug me. Um, I'm not coming back. <laughs> we, we really can't. We need, to, we need to mature as Christians and there's grace for that. There's people that are new Christians or looking at this thing and wondering who God is and God has grace for that. But there comes a time that we need to stop drinking that spiritual milk and eat some spiritual food. And I'm trying to do that in my own life. I have a story for you. Two weeks ago, I guess it was. Well, I know when it was. So whenever the lottery was up to a billion some dollars the other week, that's when this happened. We were driving to Ohio. My oldest daughter moved out there for college and we were going out to visit her. And as we got going out the road, my daughter Macy and my wife Tina were with me. And there was a big sign along the road that says one point some billion dollars. I'm like, yeah, dog, we're getting some tickets. And I don't play the lottery much. It was one of the things at work that I'd throw a couple bucks in when it got like 50 whatever millions or 400 some. But the interesting part, we got to the gas station, we filled up, the girls went in and I came in and Tina's like, I'm doing something I've never done in my life. I'm buying a lottery ticket. So she's like a little goody goody, I guess. But she bought her first lottery ticket at, well, I won't tell her age because you never do that, but. So we bought these tickets and the cool thing was we got in the car and for like, we were two hours from where we were heading to Taylor and I think for an hour and 50 minutes we talked about all the things we were gonna do with the money. I was gonna buy an island because I wanna get away from everybody. <laughs> but the cool thing was right away, my wife said something and it, it was a little bit in me but it's something she's passionate about and her passion rubbed off on me instantly is we were gonna take all that money and, get in, and invest in Christian schools 
Christian schools for parents to have the opportunity to pull their kid out of public school and avoid teachings that you may not agree with that are happening in public schools and make a move. And the cool thing about this story is we watch this one pastor a lot. My wife watches him all the time. His name is Gary Hamrick from Cornerstone Church in Loudoun County, Virginia. And if any of you have watched the news over the past couple of years with COVID and all that stuff going on, there's been this uproar in the news about this little county in Virginia, one of the richest counties in the, state, in the country. And what's happening there, there's a church down there that's on fire for God, and they're teaching their people that come different things about what God says and what should be in our life. And these folks would go to the school board meetings, and you probably saw some of the clips, and they would stand up to the school board and say, no, not my kids, you're not teaching them that. And one of the folks there spoke, and he was a gym teacher, and he lost his job because of what he said. And basically, all he said was, I'm not calling boys girls, and I'm not calling girl boys right now at this first grade level. I'm not doing it. And he got fired. He did eventually get rehired. But my point of talking about the lottery story, too, is, and I think I might have missed this part in the first uh, service that was, I, I really want to share, is it was all good and dandy when we had all this money that we thought we were going to win. And then we didn't win. We woke up Saturday. I didn't run to the thing, you know, the news, but we were eating breakfast, I think, Tina, and the TV was on, and somebody won from Illinois. I'm like, dang. <laughs> what were the odds, right? Like 50 trillion to none that I was going to win. But I knew what I was going to do with all the money, and it really hit me. It was like God said, Steve, what are you going to do with what you have, right? And I was like, and Tina and I talked over breakfast, and we didn't commit an amount yet, but we both know that we're committed to helping Christian schools start up or ones that are started up. We're going to help fund them. We're going to pray for them. I'd love to see one in our region more than what is out there available. Because down there right now, as of the other day, there's 500 seats for those kids in that school in Loudoun County. And guess how many applications they have? Over 5,000. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I think people are getting hungry for righteousness. Amen. They are. And we need people to start where they're at and we need people to, do, to, to use what they have. And if we do that, more of these type of opportunities might just come up. I want to talk about a chain of events for you. I'm going to try to throw some dates to it. April 21st, 1855, a man named Edward, Edward Kimball walked into a shoe store and he had a burden on his heart to, to witness to a shoe salesman. He was a young guy. And he went in the shoe store and he witnessed to this young shoe salesman and he led him to Christ. And the name of that shoe salesman was D.L. Moody. I think most of us have probably heard the name. We might not know all the history, but D.L. Moody was one of the biggest evangelists in the late 19th century and early 1900s. He led thousands and hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. He started a civil war outreach for four years and he would literally minister right on the battlefield as the bullets were flying by. I can only imagine how many people he led to Christ in those situations. Because most of us are like that. We don't look up to God until we're completely on our back. Thank God for D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody inspired a, a pastor named Frederick Meyer to a different level. And Frederick Meyer started a nationwide revival type ministry. Frederick Meyer led Wilbur Chapman to Christ. Wilbur Chapman helped start Passion for Athletes and he helped start the YMCA. Do you see where I'm going? William Chapman leads Major League Baseball player Billy Sunday to the Lord. Billy quits baseball, a uh, uh, prestigious thing, you know, everybody looks up to ball players. He leaves baseball to continue into full-time ministry. Billy Sunday's in uh, North Carolina, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, with a revival service, and he had another gentleman with him, another evangelist of the time named Mordecai Ham, and their dome revival service is right near a high school. And Mordecai Ham, if you read about him, I learned so much about him the last couple of days. He was, he was a tough cat. Like, uh, he really intrigued me. He, he said some things that, man, if you'd say him today as a Christian, they'd probably lock you up. One thing he was known as, he said, he, one of his quotes was, he says, I love all men, but I fear no man. So this young 17-year-old was at this high school, and uh, his name was William Frank. And many of his friends used to visit. There was a house right next door to the school. It was, called, it was a house of ill repute was the story. And I didn't know what that meant, and I looked it up. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a place where the oldest business in the world takes place, where people pay money for certain things. So Mordecai Ham's thought was to preach here, and he wanted to show these young folks and the people in the community Christ, and that there was a better way. 
Well, like I said, this 17-year-old boy, tall, lanky, dirty, blonde-haired guy, was intrigued. He went to a meeting, and then he was so intrigued, he went another night to listen. And it wasn't Billy Sunday speaking. His story goes to say that he was really interested in Billy Sunday because he was a ball player. But Billy had something come up, and the gentleman that filled in for him was Mordecai Ham. And this young William Frank was there. Frank was his middle name, and he gave his life to Christ that night. And you would know this gentleman better by his full name, Billy Graham. William Franklin Graham, that is. William Franklin Graham, was the, he's the biggest evangelist in the, in the history of time. He's preached to more people than Apostle Paul. Do you see what I'm saying? This fascination chain of events all started in 1855 with an ordinary guy, an ordinary person. He was a Sunday school teacher. He wasn't a prestigious person. I don't, from everything I looked up on him, he had no big checkbook. He was just a guy that loved God. God nudged his heart on a Saturday, his day off of work, his day to go do whatever he wanted. He went in and witnessed to D.L. Moody. Can you imagine if he wouldn't have followed through what the difference would be in our world? It could be very drastically different. And what I'm saying is a lot of you folks here that I know, and maybe I don't know you, God has called you. You've been in ministry here a long time. It's a long road. It's a grind, right, Alan? Yeah. What I'm trying to say is if you're discouraged, don't be discouraged. Think of Edward Kimball and his faithfulness and, and what, he's, what chain of events followed by him being obedient and just being a simple Sunday school teacher. Here was a cool comment I came across from a quote from a guy named Robert Schuller, Robert H. Schuller. He said, you can count the apples on a tree, but only God knows how many apples are in a seed. I'm going to be closing here. The next thing I want to show you, I want to show you a, a video clip. It's probably about 40 seconds long. We'll see what we get out of it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, now go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. As I said in the first service, I've been trying for a long time now since I've been a follower of Christ to follow Jesus and his words, but sometimes I go back to Rocky. <laughs> it just does something for me. I'm going to do some push-ups on the way home or something. <laughs> but you know, that clip is just what Christ said too. Like, it just kind of makes us laugh. But in all reality, like, Rocky's right, man. Like, it, it, we're going to get beat up. And I used to think throwing the punches was like the thing that made you look tough. It's just the opposite. It's how hard you can get hit and get back up. It really is. I look at my friend Ben over there. He's been beat a few times. He just keeps swinging. He's a miracle. The odds were stacked up against him. They still are. He beat these odds. He beat these odds. He's got these odds against him. It's happening. It's, it's happening. We've all seen that. Many of you come here know what I'm talking about with Ben. They're all over. There's miracles all over in front of you. My friend here has his daughter. They just testified. They came to visit from Danville, him and his wife. She was deaf. She couldn't hear. We, you know, come, they come to our Bible study. They came down to support me today, and I say thank you for that. But our church and people in our church and people in our life group prayed and prayed, and little baby Ellie can hear perfectly fine. And no one here will tell Caitlin any different or Rob. How much time do we have? Five minutes? I, 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 wasn't, I have a personal story. I'm going to try to wrap it up quick. My daughter's laughing at me. But I shared in the first service. Then Tina, told me, then Tina told me somebody she knew came to her and said what I said at the end she needed to hear. So I'm going to say it again. I'm going to do it real quick, try to. My, I worked at a place for almost 30 years, a corporate big company. My wife still works there. I don't work there anymore. COVID came. I wasn't getting the shot. I'm not looking at you folks. If you got the shot, any different than me, it's up to you. I'm all about that. 
but my wife and I knew we didn't want to get it, and we were not getting it. We applied for a religious exemption, what we, which we had gotten before for the flu shot, so it wasn't new to us to go through this at this company. And we got it, and I came in on a Friday, and I read my email, and it said, you got your thing, you're, you don't have to get the shot. And I was like, nothing felt right about it. Like I wasn't excited, no enthusiasm. I was just like... And then I looked back to February before that, I spoke here, and there was a gentleman in the crowd who I didn't know, and he came up to me afterwards, and he, he's like, hey, I normally don't, this doesn't happen to me, but my family has a business, and he's like, God told me to offer you a job. I was like, I'm, I had no intention of leaving a Geisinger. The odds of me leaving a Geisinger were nothing. I kind of, it was kind of cool, but I was like, eh. Left it go. September comes, I'm in this situation at work, and... Knew I wasn't going it, felt strongly about not doing it, got the exemption, and I had all these other job offers start popping up. Like people, somebody here at church heard that I might be looking. They talked to their boss. He called me, who I kind of knew. He offered me a great job. Another person offered me a job. And long story short, I ended up leaving my comp- the company I worked for for almost 30, well, 29 years. My uh, last day was in November or whatever it was. But November 8th, I started with a new company. And before I make it look like I need a GoFundMe page. I don't, but I'm in the small corporate world, or small private sector now. I work for an amazing company, Christian to own. The owner prays for his people in our staff meeting. The people in the office, there's four of us, they're all believers. Like, I hit the jackpot, man. I did, though, on paper. I want to show you a few things on paper. Maybe somebody here's up against a decision. On paper, it doesn't make sense to go do what you think God's calling you to do. You know what I mean? On paper, we write down the pros and cons. All my pros were basically this. I had $250,000 of life insurance free if I die and my wife gets. I got six, one day less of six weeks a year in vacation. Five weeks, four personal days. I had over 1,000 sick hours saved. I had four or 500 hours in my time off bank that I could take off. I had a 401k. I, had, I could go on with the benefits I had. I had amazing benefits. And I knew I did, but... Sometimes you don't realize what you have until they're gone. And long story short, God led me. We prayed and we prayed and these doors kept opening and I made the move to the company I work for now. And afterwards, if you're looking for a job, honestly, we're hiring. It's a great company, so come see me. It's a a construction company. I laughed earlier. I don't know if I'm allowed to do that, but I did it. Advertise while I'm up here. That'll be, yeah, but anyhow. But what I'm trying to, my point is to this, I want to end with uh, I want to end with one more scripture. Ecclesiastes 7, 8. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. It's very simple. It's hard to start out no matter what you're doing. Whether it's your walk with Christ, maybe you're here today and you don't know him and you got doubts, it's hard to make that commitment. Maybe you are a Christian and God's calling you to start a business and you're scared and it's hard. The beginning is always tougher. Once you make that step and commit to God, he's going to be behind you with it. I left my job. I left a lot of benefits, but I can tell you what, my new job, I only work four days a week. I'm off every Friday. I couldn't feel better. (laughs) And I'm not worried about the benefits because you know what? God says to trust him. They can have them benefits. They can, I'll just leave it at that. They can have them. (laughs) I was going to say they can stick them, but you know what I'm saying. So I hope this word today, I hope it encourages someone. And the last thing I want to say is start where you are. Sorry, Teresa. Start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. And a little bonus, let God do the rest. Thank you all and have a great day.